Okay, now we have here, see if I can remember these numbers. Number one here, we have Tolkien's Sanctifying Myth. Number two, we have Fantasy in Your Family. Number three, Finding God in Lord of the Rings. Number four, Gospel According to Tolkien. Number five, Walking with Frodo. Number six, Fiction of Tolkien. Uh, number seven, C.S. Lewis in the Catholic Church. Eight, Billy Graham and His Friends, a Hidden Agenda. Number nine, Harry Potter and the Bible. Okay, so I have Billy Graham and His Friends here on the bookshelf behind me. I'm not going to bother to get it. But uh, here you have the first one, Tolkien's Sanctifying Myth. It says here, it is therefore not merely erroneous but patently perverse to see Tolkien's epic as anything other than a specifically Christian myth. Uh, patently perverse to see it as anything other than Christian. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> Tolkien himself said that it's not Christian. But these people, they want so bad, so bad to be able to, you know, have their witchcraft and Christianity too. Of course you can't. Um, here you have Lord of the Rings is revealed as a theological thriller. <laughs> sure it is. Sure. Yeah, right. Tell you what, let me, let me take these books here. This one, I think was the first one. Fantasy in Your Family, that one. So I can get these things in order here. Uh, Finding God in the Lord of the Rings. Like that. Gospel According to Tolkien. That. Walking with Frodo, here we go. Uh, fiction of J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, which one? Yeah, right there. Uh, C.S. Lewis and the Catholic Church. Billy Graham and his friends, back there. Harry Potter and the Bible. Okay, now I can remember. <laughs> They're all laid out there on the table. But we'll continue here. Uh, where are we at? This is a sanctifying myth here. Tolkien's own version of the creation in the Silmarillion bears a remarkable similarity to the creation story in the book of Genesis. Of course, he's trying to plagiarize that too, Tolkien. Uh, again, it says, Tolkien's myth follows the true myth of Christianity with allegorical precision. <laughs> yeah, sure, right. No, it doesn't. And Tolkien himself didn't even say, this isn't Christian. You know, it's a Catholic work. Here we go again in the sanctifying myth. It says, In Gandalf we see the archetypal, archetypal prefiguration of a powerful prophet or patriarch. At times, he is almost Christ-like. Yeah. Almost Christ-like. A wizard is almost Christ-like. You say, are these uh, American Christians really this stupid? Yes. Again, my oldest brother Kevin received the first edition of the Silmarillion, the new gift seemed almost biblical. Sure it did. Pagan stories, again the same book, pagan stories are God expressing himself through the minds of poets using such images as he found there. <laughs> pagan stories. It's God expressing himself through these Satanists. Sure, buddy. Again, same book. These are all the same book here. Um, pagans, okay, we, we already did that one. Excuse me. Strangely, Christianity today complained that the prequel, prequel was too Christian. Whereas the Lord of the Rings has been original, the Silmarillion seemed too much a copy of the Bible. Oh, yeah. I read the Silmarillion. It is not a copy of the Bible. Give me a break. Here he says, The second aspect of Tolkien's mythology that must be understood is his firm conviction that God authored the history of Middle-earth in all its manifestations, Tolkien thought that he merely served as a scrivener of God's myth. Yeah. You did not write the Lord of the Rings, implying that the story had a divine source. Tolkien agreed. A member of British Parliament said that to Tolkien there. You know, implying that it had a divine source. Well, it wasn't a divine source from heaven. It was a divine source from Satan and his angels. Okay, here you have the same book. It says, The Christian should embrace uh, and sanctify the most noble virtues to come out of the northern pagan mind. I don't think so. Uh, Tolkien thought that a vigorous Christianity stood in need of the mythologically oriented northern pagan spirit, which I showed you earlier, the Norse paganism, the Nordic mythos. Okay, 
Uh, down here it says, um, appropriating the best of pagan culture and sanctifying it as Christian, Tolkien believed that the sanctification of the pagan was an essential Christian project. That's Catholicism, folks. Sanctification of pagan concepts. They've been doing that for centuries. Down here we have the Lord of the Rings became much more than a myth for any one people or any one nation. It instead became a myth for the rest restoration of Christendom itself. Oh boy. And Tolkien actually talked about that in his one book, and he was talking about that Isengard and everything else, you know, is, is like the Holy Rome. It's like Vatican City and the Holy Roman Emperor. And who was it that, uh, what was it that happened there? The return of the king? Of the uh, Antichrist, perhaps? You say, oh, no, no, no. No, the Catholics believe in the second coming of Christ. Uh huh. But they're going to accept the Antichrist when he shows up, and that's their counterfeit Christ. Coming soon to the city of Jerusalem. That's why the Vatican's trying to get a throne there in Jerusalem. I think it's 2015 when they're going to get it. Getting close, aren't we? Down here it says, Tolkien also argued that since the events of the Lord of the Rings occur in a pre-Christian world, oh, then it'd be in the Old Testament, right? I wonder who the uh, orcs would have been then. Certainly there wasn't races of devils running around on the earth. Well, maybe Tolkien taught that the orcs were the Jews or something like that. I'm sure he wouldn't think a thing like that, you know, with the Catholics believing in replacement theology and all. Okay, here we have the same book. Sanctifying, Tolkien's Sanctifying Myth. It says here, Tolkien once referred to Gandalf as an Odinic wanderer. Tolkien also drew on numerous Christian sources for the character of Gandalf. One important source was the New Testament's The Acts of the Apostles, in which God sends an angel to let Peter out of prison. So now, Gandalf is like Peter, too, I guess, apparently. Here it says, Tolkien enjoyed mixing the pagan with the Christian. Nice. Yet it should not surprise the reader that Aragorn embodies both pagan and Christian elements. That doesn't surprise me because I know Tolkien was a Satanist. Gandalf is the prophet. Aragorn is the Christian king. Frodo is the sacrificial priest. Christian-centered mythology. Hmm. Maybe Tolkien was trying to show that uh, witchcraft and Catholicism are going to merge and they're going to bring back their king, the Antichrist. You say, what was the ring, Brian? What was the ring all about? This ring that would corrupt people. We'll talk about that as we continue. Same book up here. Sanctifying one's work makes it Opus D, the work of and for God. Well, even when it's pagan, even when it's satanic and condemned in Scripture, apparently. All right, next we have Fantasy in Your Family here. It says, with regard to the Lord of the Rings, I actually intended it to be consonant with Christian thought and belief. You know, sure he did. Down here, of course, I do not mean the Gospels tell what is only a fairy story. Only a fairy story? Yeah. But I do mean very strongly that they do tell a fairy story, the greatest. This is a Christian who writes this. The Gospels tell a fairy story. Sure. Okay, chapter... 5, page 102, it can be argued that The Lord of the Rings is a Christian classic rather than a work derived from paganism. Literature, sco literature scholars from diverse fields of specialty are in agreement on this issue. Okay, well, according to this thing, it was paganism. Paganism, paganism, paganism. And we can use paganism as, you know, God can use paganism. And this guy here, professing Christian, you know, right there is his, his picture. I was moving and stuff, and this thing fell out and fell in the mud. I didn't really feel like cleaning it up because I'm going to be burning it anyhow. But, you know, oh, it, it's, a, it's a Christian. It's a Christian. You know, it wasn't pagan. Sure. Here he says, 
the values that emerge in the Lord of the Rings are the values that emerge in the Gospels. Uh huh. The figure of in the figure of Gandalf, we see the archetype of an Old Testament patriarch, his staff apparently having the same power as that possessed by Moses. Also, now he's Moses too, you know. In his apparent death and resurrection, we see him emerge as a Christ-like figure. A real Christian couldn't be this dense to actually say, well, you know, a wizard symbolizes Moses and also Jesus Christ. Here he says, explore Tolkien's timeless story and discover the ultimate sto true story of God. You can read Lord of the Rings and you can go to hell and you can burn and you never, ever, ever are going to see anything about Jesus Christ having to pay for your sins because you are a sinner that deserves to go to hell. You'll never see that. You will never see anywhere in there where the characters are put down and it takes God manifest in the flesh to die on a cross, a horrible, bloody death, and to pay for your sins and you come to him as a sinner that you are and you get saved you're never going to see that in Lord of the Rings. You can read that thing till you're blue in the face. And it's it's popular with witches. In this folder here, back in here, I go to I, I was on witches witchcraft forums and stuff like this, and they love the Lord of the Rings. Johnny Todd said that it was required reading as a witch. Continuing here, here we have the third one. Uh, the Finding God in the Lord of the Rings it says here, The result has been that millions, many of whom reject formal religion, have encountered realities that it flourished in the unexplored regions of Christian belief. By reading Tolkien. Unexplored regions of Christian belief. Uh, yeah, sure. You know. Here we have... Uh, whoop, got to go down. Uh, chapter 6, page 228. He says... That's the way it happened in Strider's case, and in this sense, Tolkien's king incognito reflects a fundamental biblical principle. He is an important way, a model in a series of biblical archetypes, a series that culminates in the archetype of all archetypes, Jesus Christ himself. So this Aragorn guy, this king, that's, you know, the return of the king, it's Jesus Christ. Sure. Here he says... Mysterious Light, page 61. Why didn't Jesus take the world when it was presented to him on a silver platter? Why, though the creeds affirmed that he was very God of very God, did he conclude that divinity, along with the infinite power and potential that go with it, was not something to be grasped? When opportunity came knocking, why didn't he get up and open the door? Huh? This guy is the vice president of of focus on the family, and he is saying when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, and he offered, he said, you fall down and worship me, I'll make you a god. You know, I'll give you everything. You can be a god. And the guy says, "I got you got to wonder why when Jesus, when divinity was offered to him, uh, why didn't he take it? And this guy's a Christian? Um, news flash there, Brainiac. Jesus Christ was God, is God, and he still is God today. And he always will be God. He didn't take divinity from Satan because he already had it. And he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Why did he say that? Because Jesus is God. Look at this. Christ chose a very different path. He did not grasp. He chose instead to lean upon another. He led, let great opportunity pass him by. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You say, well, I, don't, I don't really believe it. You're just showing us this stuff on paper, Brian. You're not, you're not really showing us this stuff. All right. Because if you're believing that, you know, here we have the book, Finding God in the Lord of the Rings. There you go. Right there it is. You can pause it and read it. Right there. Let me make it straight for you. There you go. All right. Page 63. Yeah, right there. Christ chose a very different path. He did not grasp. He chose instead to let lean upon another. He let great opportunity pass him by. Okay. There you see it. So again, my quotes that I put into my notes right here, 
these things are from these books. And I'm giving you page number, chapter number, everything. It's right there. How could you have a saved man make a statement like that? That divinity was offered to Jesus Christ and he didn't take it. You know why? One of the reasons for that? Because the new versions talk about he, uh, what's the verse? Um, the King James Bible says, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You know, Jesus was crucified between two thieves. He was crucified as a thief. But it wasn't robbery that he was equal. You know, he, he didn't steal the title from God. Why? Because he was God. But the new versions, they say, instead of thought it not robbery to be equal with God, they say, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. See, so this guy reads a new version that comes from the Vatican, where Tolkien comes from, and he says, well, Jesus, he couldn't grasp, grasp divinity. He wasn't really God. Well, I hate to tell you, if you don't believe that Jesus wasn't God, then you are not saved. Because if he was just a man and he died on the cross, his blood couldn't do anything for you. But let's continue. Finding God in Lord of the Rings, page 97, he says, To the inhabitants of Gondor, he is no longer merely Strider, ranger of the north. He is now Elisar, Elfstone, ruler of the west, and lord of many great lords. Hmm, lord of lords, king of kings, Revelation 19. As such, he cannot fail to remind us of Jesus. Once the humbler, humble carpenter of Nazareth, now the rider on the white horse, the word of God, whose name is faithful and true. Yes, they are trying to picture the coming Antichrist. Because these guys don't worship Jesus Christ. They aren't for the Jesus Christ of Revelation 19. And you got to remember that the Antichrist shows up first in Revelation chapter 6 on a white horse. All right? He's a counterfeit. That's what these guys believe in. Okay, epilogue to this Finding God in Lord of the Rings thing. It says here, Tolkien then was an artist. When he sat down to write, he was trying to make something something that would be considered beautiful and compelling purely by virtue of its faithfulness to its own inner laws, and it's at this point that the specifically Christian and biblical roots of his thought begin to emerge. Right. Then we have, next we have the Gospel according to Tolkien, and it says here, Tolkien's Gospel. Okay, the Christian didn't mention of this great book, Faith and Fantasy, talking about that, you know. The gospel can be discerned, I will argue, in this book with a pre-Christian setting. What? You can discern the gospel with a in a pre-Christian setting. Well, I'll grant you, in the King James Bible, there are prophecies in the Old Testament that point to the New Testament fulfillment. But in Tolkien's work? Give me a break. Here we go, introduction page four. Tolkien's work is all the more deeply Christian for not being overtly Christian. Okay, there's another way you can say that. You ready? Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. It's Christian, but not overtly Christian. Same book. Tolkien's book is pre-Christian only in chronology, not in content. The gospel resounds in its depths. Sure it does. Christians are thus summoned to become little Christ, incarnating our own versions of Gandalf and Aragorn, Frodo and Sam, Faramir, Faramir and Eowyn. We can be little Christ. Sure. What did Jesus Christ say in Matthew chapter 24? Take heed that no man deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ. Don't worry about stuff like that. It's little technical details. Down here it says, Virtually the entire gospel can be discerned in this triple decker that Tolkien labored so diligently in both mind and body to bring to completion. The uh, entire gospel? Really? Oh, really? And see, the, the whole thing is, again, brethren, why do you think this stuff, you can go into a Christian bookstore and they're selling this exact set right here. This box set. I've seen this thing. The box set here. Let me show you. This thing, these three books. You know, actually, no, it's the four books. It's, it's actually the, the Hobbit as well. They sell this. 
You can go to, uh, what's the Christian Book Distributors or whatever, christianbook.com or something like that. They'll sell it. Why? Because of these people out in here coming out and saying, oh, it's Christian, it's Christian. You can find the gospel in it. Oh, it's, it's wonderful, it's Christian. Okay, here it says, same book. The Son of God's refusal to regard His equality with the Father as a thing to be grasped, just as Christ empties Himself of His divine eternality in order to assume the form of a mortal servant and to become obedient unto death, even crucifixion. So, in her infinitely smaller way, does Arwen give up her undying life to perish alongside her beloved Aragorn. So now you have Christ being symbolized by a woman elf. Down here he says, Tolkien is close to Paul and Augustine and their long train of followers. <laughs> yeah. Tolkien and the Apostle Paul, boy, they were just a, thought the same way. Number four. Aragorn replies in terms that seem deliberately to echo Jesus' own approach to Golgotha, where he would also be crowned king, albeit of a radically different kind. Hey, yeah, sure. Just a few differences between this Aragorn and, and Jesus Christ. Just a couple. Here. Okay, we are on the fifth one now. The, the uh, Walking with Frodo here, the devotional book. Another premise is that it is not a Christian story with which I have some dispute. Certainly Tolkien's story is no more overtly Christian than the tree in my front yard. But like the tree, its very essence points to both a creator and a savior without the need to say so in plain English, or Elvish, for that matter. Tolkien was a Christian. The worldview of any author is evident in his works. The Lord of the Rings is no exception. Yeah, you see, this, this folder here reminds us of the sacrifice. This is, this is just like the Bible here. These people are mad. Here they say, Tolkien was a Christian. No, Tolkien was a Catholic. In that respect, you might say that Jesus, like Gandalf, is the Savior, and Jesus, like Aragorn, is the King. Mm -hmm. Here they say, the 18 devotions in this book are actually nine pairs, nine being a rather Lord of the Rings friendly number, don't you think? Yeah, sure, and in the occult too. You know, that's wonderful. Um, here they say, Jesus returned just as he promised, like Gandalf on the hilltop above Helm's Deep. As the fellowship did with Gandalf, in what ways have you underestimated Jesus? So again, this, this woman here, I'll show you the picture. This woman here is comparing, what's her name? Sarah Arthur, uh, comparing a wizard, a satanic wizard, to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, Almighty God. It's disgusting. Down here, she says, in fact, his denouncement of the Pharisees in Matthew 23 is enough to ruin for good any perception we might have that Jesus is just meek and mild. <laughs> well, your Jesus is just meek and mild, and he comes, and by peace he shall destroy many. Because he's the Antichrist. <coughs> I mean, these modern, you know, people that profess to be Christians, you know, they read Matthew chapter 23 and it's like, oh, it's so shocking. Oh, oh, why? Well, because the Jesus isn't there. Jesus in there is not the guy that they like to worship. Here she says, Gandalf the good wizard. Uh-huh. Down here, we have the most critical difference between Rowling and Tolkien is the spiritual perspectives from which they created their stories. Tolkien was unabashedly Christian. So which book is that? This book right here, Harry Potter and the Bible by Richard Abanes. Yeah, you know, Harry Potter so much different. I mean, he was a bad wizard, but Tolkien had good wizards. Oh, no, wait. Saruman was a bad wizard. Oh, well, um, uh, uh, 
well, that's just because he was good and he went bad later on. And sure. Of course, about Tolkien and Catholicism. <clears throat> From Sanctifying Myth here, it says, In the true, though exiled, kingship of Aragorn, we see glimmers of the hope for a restoration of truly ordained, i.e. Catholic, authority. You see what I'm saying? You say, oh, you're crazy, Brian. You're coming up with all this stuff. You just, you conspiracy theories and all these other things. I ain't coming up with nothing. Okay. They are depicting the Antichrist and the restoration of the Roman Catholic Empire. You know, the one that brought in the Dark Ages, the one that tortured people that dissented from their system. That's what Tolkien is symbolizing. Okay, it says here, again, the same book, Sanctifying Myth. It says, I love Tolkien and even prayed for him along with my deceased father every night before bed. Uh, it's a very, very sad thing there. A lot of Catholics think that they can actually pray for their lost relatives, the ones that are dead. Uh, no, if they died as Catholics, then they're in hell and they will be there forever. Actually, you know, they come up at the Great White Throne Judgment, are judged finally, and then they go to Lake of Fire. So they do come up for a little bit. But uh, they're in hell. Sad. And, I, you know, and again, people you know, mistake me for when I get passionate like this and I get fired up. They say, you don't have any love. I have love because I'm warning you. Not having love is somebody that's, that sits there and says, oh, it's fine. It's fine. There's no problem. There's no sin. There's nothing. There's no, nothing wrong. Just go ahead and eat the poison. I'm fired up because I'm saying this stuff is toxic. It's poison. You want to talk about the worst time period in history, it's when the Antichrist comes back and rules and reigns and Catholicism is in control again. You talk about nightmare world that you're going to be living in. Unless you go along with the system. You know. It says here in the preface, I loved Tolkien and he... Oh, I read that one, sorry. Uh, next one. The Lembus, the Blessed Sacrament, Galadriel, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So, you know, if you know the story of this... Uh, Lady Galadriel, they're there in the elf kingdom, and she gives them these elf bread, you know, it's the, the lembas, you know, and all the stuff like this. And it's supposed to symbolize the little cookies, the consecrated host that the Catholics eat. Again, it's just Catholic stuff. I mean, give me a break. This stuff isn't Christian. Here he says, um, Tolkien's belief that the best of the pagan world should be sanctified reflects St. Augustine's thinking. And it does. The St. Augustine, you know, sanctified paganism. The progress of the tales ends in what is far more like the reestablishment of an effective Holy Roman Empire with its seat in Rome. What did I tell you? That is what they're symbolizing right there. The white city is the Vatican. Or, you know, I think it partly too that the Antichrist is going to be ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. Why? Because it's a counterfeit of what Jesus Christ is going to do. But let's continue here. Uh, the that Tolkien should place a mythologized, mythologized Italy in an ultimately room at the center of his legend, legendarium is not surprising since he view, viewed the Reformation as ultimately responsible for the modern secularized world. Sure he did, he's a Catholic. As he told a Jesuit friend, the Lord of the Rings is a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. So he had it. Again, it says about it's Catholic. Okay, throughout his life, Tolkien considered his mother a martyr for Roman Catholicism. As a convert to the faith, she suffered intense, intense anti-Catholic bigotry from her immediate and extended family. Oh, poor martyr. Oh, those poor martyrs of the Catholics that, that suffered at the hands of independent Baptists and, and, and Bible-believing Christians and nasty people that were against Catholicism. Oh, I just want to weep me a break. You know, you want to talk about martyrs? Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read the Martyr's Mirror. Read things like that to talk about how the Catholics tortured Christians into the millions. Read about Bloody Mary there in England. Here he says, I find it very hard and bitter when my children stray away from Catholicism. The like sheep leaving the fold, I guess. In addition to his strong devotion to Mary, Tolkien frequently prayed to various saints for their intercession. Hey, you know, okay. 
Here he says, uh, it never equaled the quality or enchantment of the elven uh, lembus there. Like it's supposed to symbolize the sacrament, you know, the little cookie thing. And he says about the enchantment of it. I thought that was kind of interesting because, you know, you do take the sacrament there as a Catholic. You are being enchanted. Back to the thing here. It says, second only in importance to the Blessed Sacrament for Tolkien was the, were the, was the Theotokos Mary, the mother of God. Hmm. Yeah. The most obvious Marian figure is Galadriel. Even though she must repent for her crimes against the valor and the first age, Tolkien wrote, It is true that I owe much of this character to Christian and Catholic teaching and imagination about Mary. Elberth serves as Mary, another Marian figure in the Legendarium, the angelic wife of Manwi and maker of light and stars. She serves like Mary in Roman Catholic theology as the queen of heaven. Got to read the Bible sometime back in the book of Jeremiah. See what the Queen of Heaven is all about. It says here, Frodo's final journey, Tolkien explained, was a purgatorial one, but one of healing, not suffering. Warped Catholic teaching. You go down and you burn for a while, but it's healing. It's not suffering. Burning in fire is healing. That's wonderful, good stuff, I guess. It's kind of like a sauna, only better. <laughs> okay, it says here, they act, also act as citizens of the blessed realm, elves talking about there, knowing that they are immortal, as did the monks who knew that they lived half on earth and half as citizens of God's heavenly kingdom. <laughs> yeah, the monks. Sure they did. Um, Tolkien ultimately wanted his myth to end in something like the reestablishment of an effective holy Roman Empire, empire with its seat in Rome. Okay, this is the, uh, which one are we at here? Um, okay, the sanctifying myth one, still. Number one there. Here he says, Interestingly enough, like the Virgin Mary in Catholic theology, Aragorn dies on of his own free will. Read that one already. Many of the so-called fascists he believed, such as Franco in Spain, actually protected the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, yeah, and so did Hitler. Sign a concordant with the Vatican. Franz von Papen. Historical fact. Pope Pius the was it 12th? I think it was. You know, signing a concordant. It says here, certain characteristics of the Elf Queen Galadriel mirror aspects of the Roman Catholic concept of the Virgin Mary. Talked about that before. Uh, Tolkien thanked the priest for his perceptive interpretations and agreed that he indeed had placed many of his views concerning Mary into the character of Galadriel. Again, we talked about that before. You this blonde-haired, you know, elf sorceress queen, you know, and stuff like this, and this is Mary. Um, down here you have Sam's devotion to Galadriel is mystical and Marian. He's a good little Catholic. Galadriel bears a certain likeness to the Virgin Mary. Boromir admits his sin, and if the future king were also a priest, hearing his last, as if, excuse me, the future king were also a priest, hearing his last confession. That's wonderful, isn't it? This Boromir guy was a, a, a man, and he gets all shot up with arrows, and he's laying down there, and he says, I'm sorry, I was wrong, whatever, he confesses his sin to the good Antichrist king here. All right, continuing on. Read a bunch more quotes here for Tolkien. However, even pagan myths attempted to express God's greater truths. By one estimate, The Lord of the Rings has sold over 150 million copies since its publication in the mid-1950s. Sure, you know, pays to serve Satan. When the army asked Michael Tolkien to list his father's profession, it should surprise no one that he answered, Wizard. Could have actually been a little bit more true than we realize. Okay. And I apologize about this next quote. It says here, um, a guy from his uh, little group there, his little secret society that met at the pub, they're, they're reading through this thing. Tolkien's reading, you know, Lord of the Rings chapter by chapter. And a guy named Dyson quotes this. He says, oh, bleep, not another elf. Fine Christian men there, you know. Tolkien's popularity seems to have spread to Cornell, Cornell via its math department to a black magic group at the University of Virginia. Gotta love that. 
And to the very nicest people at Bryn Mawr, a writer for Esquire reported. So you got a black magic group at the University of Virginia. Hmm. Chapter 1, page 16. Hippies and the political left embraced the tri trilogy in the mid to late 1960s. It was purportedly one of drug guru Timothy Leary's favorite books and head chips Head shops, excuse me, throughout the United States sold all manner of Tolkien paraphernalia. As Beatles biographer Philip Norman has reported, the Lord of the Rings became a vital part of hippie culture, finding admirers among the devotees of Indian religion, cannabis, and free love, said the Berkey Campus bookstore manager in 1966. This is more than a campus craze. It's like a drug dream. Oh, it's Christian. It's a wonderful Christian thing. You can find God in the Lord of the Rings. You can find him there. Then why are these people that are into fornication and drugs and all kinds of stuff, why are they saying it's, a, it's like a drug dream being in this thing? If it's the gospel like this, do you think a bunch of hippies sitting around reading this book, do you think that they'd be like, wow, it's like a drug dream, dude? No, it wouldn't. They'd be convicted that they're sinners and then they're on, the, on their way to hell. Continuing here, chapter 2, page 26. Tolkien describes his experience when writing, The other power then took over the writer of the story, by which I do not mean myself, that one ever-present person who was never absent, never named. Talked about that before. As Tolkien admitted to Clyde Kilby, the secret fire Gandalf's master is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is indwelling the wizard, Gandalf the wizard. You know what that is? That's called blasphemy. Here he says orc means demon, right there. Galadriel's elvish craft was a form of magia or enchantment, which the Bible condemns. But she's Mary. She's a virgin Mary. Yes, yeah, she is. Conclusion... Page 127, speaking about a radical environmentalist group called Elf Lore, Elf Lore which sees itself as attempting to live out the Hobbit's message of communalism and harmony with nature is just one example of the Tolkien-inspired environmental groups that flourished primarily in the 1960s and early 1970s. But I thought that his works were bringing back people to the Bible and, and salvation and things. Sure it was. Page 129, environmentalists are not the only ones that who have laid claim to Tolkien's legacy. Perhaps more preponderant are the legends, legions of fantasy writers, fantasy readers, occult card players, such as Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons players. Hmm. And there's a young man, Sean Sellers, that actually killed his parents because he was into Satanism, and he got into Satanism because of Dungeons and Dragons. Page 130. They took me up the hill to Eglador, or the Forgotten Land, writes one reporter, where dozens of teenagers gathered around a small campfire. All kinds of young people were there, punks, hippies, fans of heavy metal, but their petty differences were unimportant compared with their com common love of Tolkien. Sure. Here he says again, Kazakhstan's pro-Islamic government has arrested such Tolkien devotees for being Satanists and conducting dark rituals. Well, Islam doesn't have much sense, but at least they had sense to do that. But in the end, Tolkien's popularity goes well beyond the environmentalists, the fantasy devotees, and the freaks. Approximately 150 million copies of The Lord of the Rings have sold throughout the world. Yeah. Speaking about Peter Jackson, it says here, It seemed unlikely that anyone who could direct Heavenly Creatures, a chilling movie about two teenagers who murder one of their mothers by crushing her skull with a brick, could only could ever properly capture Tolkien's vision. Peter Jackson, the guy that made the Lord of the Rings movies, these, where do I have them over here? You know, these movies over here. Peter Jackson, the, the director of it, made this sick, disgusting movie. And he's been involved in other satanic movies and stuff, blood and death and everything else. And of course he puts it into these things. You know, these guys are going, oh, I don't really understand how that could happen. You know, it's a wonderful spiritual movie and or books and stuff and how could this dark man, this dark producer, produce such a wonderful Christian thing? <laughs> That's how blind these people are. 
Continuing, it says here he is a self-professed Star Trek fan who was himself, who has himself been nursed by fairy tales, science fiction, and works of fantasy. All right. Uh, this is this Richard Abanes guy, by the way. Abanes, however, it must be stressed, is not advocating the banning or the burning of Harry Potter, nor does he even see say that reading Harry Potter is necessarily harmful to every child. He is worried, though, about these books' effects on some children and demonstrates the validity of his concerns by citing child development research. But he's a Christian. Yes, yeah, sure, he's a Christian. You don't quote the Bible and say it's wrong according to Scripture. You quote child developmental researches or resources. Research. Excuse me, I had it right the first time. Just disgusting. Down here it says, To many persons such an experience is nothing less than a gift from God. As the Bible says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Okay? So it's a, it's a good thing, you know, this Tolkien stuff. Yeah. Clearly just because a story contains supernatural beings or bizarre creatures, some of which may be frightening, does not mean it is bad. <laughs> See, you know, if you go out and you're like, I wonder if this Lord of the Rings stuff is bad. You know, I don't, I don't really know what to think. I mean, you look at this in the, in the store and you go, in the Christian bookstore, you know, and you go, I don't know, maybe it seems okay. I, I, well, well here's, here's a book. Fantasy in your family. Oh, isn't that nice? Christian Publications. You know, back there, Christian Publications, Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. Oh, wow, it's a Christian book. You know, and you go here into the front cover and it says... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Scripture references labeled KJV are taken from the Holy Bible King James Version. And uh, unless otherwise indicated, Scripture taken from the Holy Bible New International Version. you got to love that, too. I always love how they do this. They capitalize everything, New International Version. And then it, King James Version, little tiny, you know, small lettering down here. Yeah. But, you know, you go into the Christian bookstore as a, as a professing Christian couple and you go, or a parent, and you say, well, here's a Christian book. And you come out and you read it, and it says, you know, it's not bad. It's not bad. Even some of these wizards and witches and stuff, that's not bad, because it's just in the realm of fantasy, and fantasy is good for you. Sure. Here he says, chapter 1, page 20, alternate reality separate from the real world. Okay. The joy and excitement we feel as we retreat into a fantasy book's alternate reality. Alternate reality. He goes on to say about this. Kids, kids who are never encouraged to enter the fantasy world are quite literally deprived children. Okay. I would say kids that go in, are going into alternate realities and fantasy worlds are you know, mentally sick, need help. Chapter 2, page 33. Literature, especially fantasy, can affect children so deeply that their reading experience is nothing less than a kind of spiritual event. Yeah, they get possessed. Finally, fantasy, including science fiction, and to a degree, even some types of horror, can offer hope. <laughs> okay. Even horror movies, you know, horror books and horror films, pick up some Stephen King books for your children. This is the kind of junk that gets sold in Christian bookstores. Down here, chapter 2, page 36 of that same book, he says, In alternate reality, so parents must not automatically reject a fantasy book just because it may mention wizard spells and or magic. Such elements are not necessarily reflective of real occultism. What's this not necessarily? It's not necessarily bad. It's just not necessarily. Don't reject things just because it has Satanism in it. I mean, come on. 